We're coming to you live from our Manhattan Beach headquarters here in California. My name is Simon Sproul, I'm Fisker's Senior VP of Communications. And with me today are Henrik Fisker, our co-founder, chairman and CEO, and Nadia Arnout, our Senior Director of Interior Design, Colour and Materials. Welcome to both of you. So this live stream event is the latest, it's the second one we've done, in a series of conversations with Fisker's senior leaders. And the goal is to keep everyone in our Fisker community informed about our processes as we prepare for the launch of the Fisker Ocean, which is going to debut at the LA Auto Show just next month. And production of the Fisker Ocean is on track to start on November 17th, 2022. So we're going to chat today for about 20 minutes about Fisker's philosophy of building electric vehicles that enable a clean future for us all. Vehicles that are both beautifully designed, sustainable and innovative. And at the end, we'll be able to take your questions. But let's first learn a little bit more about Henrik and, and Nadia. So Henrik, first question to you. Tell us a story about how you and Nadia first started working together. Well, I was working at uh, BMW Design Work in California at the time, running that facility. And uh, I think we, met, we must have met around 98, 99, I think. And uh, Nadia was working in the product department because we had product design and car design separate. And I thought it would be interesting to see how we could actually combine the two because if you think about an interior, it's really probably 50 products that are sort of individual designed. And I think we, we, in the 80s, we sort of came out of the era where everything was super swoopy and it's almost like a melted sort of uh, uh, bakery pot or something like that. And then we came into the 90s and, and of course, there's been a lot of designs where we have tried to make it pure product design, but that's also very difficult because we got a very complicated interaction in, in sort of that three-dimensional environment you're in with doors that's opening and seats that has to move. So you can always make it look good in one view, but then as soon as you start moving things, it doesn't look the same. So anyway, long story short, um, we, uh, uh, you know, I th we tried at, at, at that point to sort of incorporate product design with car design, and that's really how I got to, to know Nadia. And of course, later she moved on to, to work on the BMW Z4 and, and other vehicles. So uh, I think she has sort of the best of both worlds. Yeah. And, how, and how did you end up joining forces at your first company, first, at Fisker Automotive? So uh, I remembered Nadia from those days and I got in contact with her. I forgot exactly how. And then I had her drive two hours from wherever she was up here down to Orange County. And, uh, 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 you know, we had a long conversation and about what we wanted to do in the future. And I think especially about sustainability and design and the emphasis on design. Um, and I think, you know, we were, I think, very radical different at that time because we really wanted to create a car company that focused on, on design rather than you know, coming from other areas. Usually it's very engineering driven or marketing driven. So I think hopefully that was attractive at that time. <laughs> and, and, and Nadia, how did Henrik convince you to come to Fisker? I guess twice he's convinced twice, you. Yep, pretty much. Um, so the, the, it didn't really take much convincing knowing him for, for that long and, and having worked with him uh, for, for many years, uh, especially this time around. I definitely um, see his vision I understand his vision, and so it, it, it feels good to be on board the new company, especially since it's all electric now. It has a focus on sustainability, um, and it's just a natural next move for me. Yeah. So um, the mission of the company uh, is to build the, mo the most sustainable vehicles in the world. So Henrik, what, why does an electric car need to really level up when it comes to being more sustainable than anything else on the road? Well, first of all, I think it's, it's clear to pretty much everyone by now that we are going fully electric. Um, but I don't think that's enough. I think we need to sort of take a step further and figure out what else can we do to make the automobile fit into the future of our society. And, and you know, the, the, the car itself has been a long discussion point, probably in the last, I would say, 30 years, where you know, politicians, people, every, you know, all the way to the extreme environmentalists, et cetera, have been sort of arguing about, can we really afford to maintain our private individual mobility? And what is the cost to society of that? And then I think there's been a lot of trials where we see how many people can we get into public transport and there's been so much push in that. I come from a country where public transport is pretty much free or super cheap. And still you couldn't get people to get, to get into it. And still, I woke up in the morning dreaming about a car. I never woke up dreaming about taking the bus, right? So I think the reality is we, we like our personal transport. So I think we, we have no other choice than figuring out 
how can we make that sustainable? And electrification is great, it's coming, but it's not enough. I think we need to look into uh, the environmental impact on manufacturing, how do our suppliers create the materials, even how do they manufacture them? And I think we, we are trying to sort of spearhead that and push for it. And we're small, we're not gonna be able to change it overnight, but whatever we can do and whoever we can bring with us, both from suppliers and customers, I think that can sort of start a trend that hopefully can evolve into that one day we have vehicles where we don't even think about that they are not fitting in our society. Right. We're gonna get into a little bit more in the into the materials in a minute, Nadia, but, but Henrik, just perhaps give us a, a big picture about the reusable material strategy for, for Fisk and, and particularly, obviously, the ocean that's coming up. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the idea with the ocean really came about that, uh, you know, living uh, here in, in California, going on the beach, and you see, you know, everyday, unfortunate plastic bottles and garbage on the beach, and I mean, that's probably one of the cleaner beaches here. You can go to other parts of the world. I've been in, you know, Mumbai. I've been in other places where it's just horrendous, the amount of... Uh, garbage that comes out of the ocean and uh, just starting to read more about how can we actually do something about that and there is a lot of uh, companies fortunately there's a lot of companies out there that are starting to collect a lot of the plastics in the ocean and recycling them and you know we start thinking about how can we use that materials and as we discovered and we went into it we, we saw that there's actually more and more recyclable materials that we can use and I remember, you know, when we started looking at that even way back 10, 15 years ago, you know, the excuse was always, well, they're not durable enough, they don't fulfill the quality standards, et cetera. But we are now at a point where I think technology and how these recyclable materials are made enable us to actually use them. And sometimes you see some of these materials here, they are, they're luxurious and they're recycled. So why wouldn't we do it? I mean, I think this is just an amazing thing that's happened that we've been able to create a luxury car out of recycled materials and for me that's actually luxury yeah. so we actually all share something we've all worked for big traditional automakers in the past so we we know how what you might call business as usual operates so nadia how does our design process for interiors let's focus on interiors now uh differ from that perhaps at a major a major automaker well obviously being a startup uh we move a lot faster um especially faster than traditional OEMs. But I think the biggest opportunity is that we can actually innovate faster as well. So when we come up with our ideas, we can come up with more ideas quicker because we don't have that traditional framework and setup, and we can bring it to the market much quicker. That means we're ahead of our competition in, in some cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to get into talking about materials now because we've got a lot here on the, uh, on the couple of tables. Um, so in terms of the materials, why, why are you looking to source as much as we can both locally and why are we prepared to invest in the suppliers that are bringing us these innovative sustainable materials? So generally in terms of materials, um, sustainability, end of life uh, awareness is extremely important for us. We're offering fully vegan uh, interiors for all trim levels um, and sourcing it locally just means that we have a lower carbon footprint. And that allows us to actually really back up that sustainability story that's part of our brand values. Yeah, and you got some examples here. Yeah, so yeah. We, we have actually a few here. Uh, carpets that are uh, 90 to 100% recycled material. Um, in some cases, that actually even benefits us from a, from a weight perspective uh, because they're a lot lighter as well. Um, then we have <coughs> a carbon material that's actually really interesting because it's a, it's a two part, let's say, mm. it's, it's an injection molded part that has an A-surface material that is made of the same mono material. That means we can grind it up at end of life and we can bring it back into the material cycle and there is no landfill material. So, so we can use it in one car and then bring it back for another car. Correct, and we're working very closely with our suppliers on this to really get that loop going and really benefit our vehicles, no matter you know, which platform it's on, but we can use that material for yeah. it. Same with our uh, fabrics, for example. This one is uh, a suede material we'll be using on our seats. It, it is 30% um, fiber filled, that means it's non-toxic, um, it's, it's recycled fiber from, from waste. So um, that's really good for, for the environment. And then <coughs> these two materials actually have a really high level of 
recyclability. They have 50 to 80 in one case and 80 to 100 percent on the other case. Also, seat material. This is actually an acoustic fabric um, that that we are using uh, in the car, and it, it gives us a lot of opportunity to just not have as much waste as yeah. cars currently have in the industry. Yeah. So that's really our advantage that we work with our suppliers really closely. We source them locally. And we really work with them long term so we can actually improve the level of recycled content uh, with them. Yeah. Um, Henry, big, big picture. Um, how does creating an electric vehicle give you the sort of freedom, the new opportunities for design and innovation? I mean, did you sort of come to Fisker Inc. and sort of let out a deep breath? Finally, you were free of a lot of constraints that you'd felt you were under for, for, for the perf you know, earlier on in your career. Well, I mean, obviously, when you start a new car company, you, you don't have any sort of traditions that you have to follow. You're not sort of bound by rules that somebody made many years ago and you kind of have to get rid of. So that's a big advantage. We're, we're sort of setting and making our own rules. And we try to make as few rules as possible. And if there is any rules, we're trying to find a way how we break them. So, you know, the whole idea is that I, I think as a startup, you can truly only be relevant if you do something different than all the traditional car makers you, you compete against. And you know, yes, we're not, of course, we don't have as much money, we're not as big as some of the big guys, but we're faster. And that's really what makes a difference, as Nadia said before. If we can bring a car to market in two and a half years, if we can decide on materials or technology, you know, as late as 18 months before we launch a vehicle, that, that's what makes a difference because that means we can bring in new technology that truly is new. So if you think about it, anybody here, if you buy a car today, the technology in that car was decided at least three years ago. When you buy a car from Fisker next year, the Fisker Ocean, the technology was decided this year, which means you're going to truly feel this technology is new. When it comes to sustainability, I think what the advantage for us is that we don't have these rigid uh, processes you have to get through to get some new materials in a vehicle. If Nadia says, hey, look, I want to try this new material here, I say, let's go, go to the supplier, let's speak with them, let's see if it works. We might take a risk sometime that, yes, maybe it's not 1,000% proven and we haven't tested it for five years. But you know what? We have a gut feel. We are professionals. We work with the suppliers. And, you know, we take a little bit of risk in it. But, you know, if, if you don't, without risk, there's no innovation. Let's face it. Otherwise, we just keep doing the same old stuff, and, and we want to change the world, and that's what we're here to do. So let's, let's turn to sort of in exterior and interior design, and, and often they're viewed as something maybe separate. I mean, hopefully the designers talk to each other, um, which I guess maybe is our different approach. Um, I mean, Henry, maybe, maybe, maybe could you give us some reflections on why you think the interior design of a car has perhaps become almost as important, maybe more important now in this tech-savvy world than the exterior? Well, well, well the, the designer... Design <laughs> so we are talking together. Um, I mean, the advantage, of course, is that I'm the CEO of the company and the design chief, so we can make a lot of decisions fairly quick. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that you really can say that one is in front of the other. I think it has to work in perfect harmony. You know, um, if you design a super cool car nobody can fit in, then it obviously doesn't work. And if you design an interior that looks worse than a minivan, then nobody will buy it. So, you know, you, in the end of the day, there is that, that perfect harmony that you have to find. Um, you know, with the ocean, we, uh, we, we looked a lot of unique storage space, how we can actually use this vehicle. We got some surprises, I think, coming up. A couple of surprises we're not even going to show actually at the LA Auto Show because uh, it's, it's uh, really different. Nobody's done it yet, so I think we'll show it next year a little closer to, to when we reveal. But even in the ocean, will show some really interesting uh, usability on the screen that nobody else have in the world. We filed a patent on it. Uh, I think we have some, some great center console, a lot of interesting ways to put things, and, and just the, the, the sort of symbol design merged together with the feeling of luxury, feeling that somebody cared, uh, that there's interest to get in the vehicle. So all these things come together. Of course, you still are always aligning the, the exterior silhouette and the belt line and everything else with with the interior, I think in our second project, which we're not going to talk so much about today, but on the pair, uh, there's a particular, uh, uh, I think, an interest, uh, interesting new way that the interior and exterior is going to come together because of the belt line that is very unique in that vehicle. Um, so we're, we're trying some new things out. Of course, you're always juggling, like I said, 
the looks of the exterior, the functionality of the interior, and then you have to think about what type of vehicle are you doing. So of course, if you're doing a two-seater sports car, it's very different than if you're doing a five-seater SUV. There has to be a lot more functionality in the five-seater SUV, clearly. So Nadia, when, when Henrik says, hey, I've got an idea, here's a sketch, here's the outside of the car, do you, do you immediately, ah, I now can picture the interior, talk to me through how, when you see an exterior design, how you think about the interior. Yeah, it's definitely that the, the exterior sets the tone, and I, I years ago came up with this thing, the exterior sets the tone, the interior plays the song. So it's hand in hand, definitely, and it, it, it is the guiding element, definitely. The language is very clean, timeless, a lot of attention to detail. So we're bringing that same thought process on the interior, but at the same time, we try to be very innovative and try to be focused on functionality, focused on sustainability. So for one, one example, you know, that clean look and feel on the ocean, we actually put a lot of effort into taking out your typical you know, bezel on surfaces, a lot of plastic parts, the interruption of surface, uh, and kept it very, very clean and tried to have a smarter approach on how can we achieve that same functionality without really destroying that main surface that you're sitting in front of, and it also gives the materials an opportunity to, to take front stage. So that's pretty much the, the approach that, that we've taken and on every vehicle also, um, once we have a, a good direction or a good overall goal for that vehicle, it's, it's then easier for us to to really try out that inside out balance and, and uh, complete that in a holistic way. Yep. So you gave me a great cue there on front stage. Um, Henrik, we're about a <laughs> month away from the LA Auto Show and we're unveiling a sustainable vehicle, but we're also unveiling a sustainable auto show stand. Perhaps tell us a little bit about your thinking behind how we're gonna present the vehicle at LA. Yeah, you know, I mean, our, our uh, brief to uh, our partner Gensler, that's the architect on the program, was really to, uh, for, for in terms of our experience centers, what well, we want to have them to be really green. And then our brief to uh, our show stand builder was the same. And we're, we're trying to really uh, make sure that they use sustainable materials. But also, just from design here, we take some inspirations from ocean, from nature. Uh, I think it's a really different type of show stand. I think it's going to be very cool. Um, so we're looking forward to surprise everybody. And, and in terms of incorporating sustainability into our booth, um, I mean, how's that, how, how are we thinking about that? Well, I think, you know, the materials uh, that we're using, uh, I, I think it's also fairly min minimalistic to a certain extent, uh, but it's always about the materials when you think about a booth, really. Uh, and how you set it up, so, and, and that, that's, I would say, the essence of that. Being able to reconfigure it, reuse it, yeah. use it multiple times, it just gets more life out of those, right. those parts. So, um, now we've, we've had quite a few questions. My phone's buzzing away here with, with, with questions, so thank you for sending those in. Um, there's a couple, one here, are the people in the back fiscal workers or paid actors? Uh, so <laughs> actually, I asked them to. Uh, they told them they'll get a raise if they hang around a so little. So they're they're they're, they're Fisker employees. They're Fisker, they're Fisker employees. employees. So there's a question here about will white interiors be the only option? So someone's trying to sneak a few product details out. So what do we want? What do we want to say about interior no, colors? Oh, we have plenty of options. We have, we have actually a lot of options mm -hmm. and a lot of variety there, um, going all the way from the from the base to the top. Um, and as Hendrik was saying, quite luxurious looking too for our. Um, high-end level so you know I want to add a thing on that you know I think that, that uh, cars have been kind of suffering from a bit of boredom when it came to colors uh, we all know that about 70 percent of all cars are either white black or silver and I think this is probably the same with like black and gray interiors so I think we're gonna come out with a real nice colorful interior uh, we're gonna show at the LA Auto Show uh, of course we'll have white and black because they're just big sellers but we have another surprise, and I think it's going to be really interesting, and nobody else, I think, have anything that's even close to that. And we have a surprise in how the design of, for instance, the seats are done, uh, which is very, very unique, and I think will be one of the first in the world to use that technology to get a completely different shape in the seat and a different way of laying out the seams, etc. So a very practical question here. Are these interior materials easy to vacuum and clean? Oh yes, absolutely, and especially with what Henrik just mentioned on the seats. Uh, we actually have a construction of the seat where you don't have your typical trenches and little 
um, areas where, where things get stuck, so it'll be a lot easier to clean than your, your conventional vehicle. Great, great. Um, let's see, what will, what will we see at the LA Auto Show? Well, well, we'll, we'll have two uh, Fisker Oceans there, produc production intent vehicles, um, which are pretty much the production cars. Of course, they come off, uh, you know, they're made, of course, with, with somewhat early tooling. We're, we, are, we don't have the long lead tooling yet. We're actually doing the first stampings, et cetera, over at, and, and get them shipped into Magna. They are done at, at uh, Magna Stampings Facility in Europe. Uh, but so there's two vehicles you're going to see uh, on the show. Uh, will be uh, the two, two of the launch colors that we are showing uh, and you're going to be able to order the vehicles exactly like that. Um, we, are, we are showing um, the uh, what we call, I, I think I shouldn't be saying that yet, but Fisker Ocean 1 we're going to call the launch edition. So there was a little uh, secret coming out here. And uh, we will offer uh, standard 22 inch wheels. We'll have some really interesting mix of materials, never been done, I think, at least not in, in a high volume production. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, and, and they'll be in, you know, complementary in that package. So I think that's going to be pretty exciting. And we, are, of course, are going to explain about the details of the powertrain, uh, details about batteries, detail about the technology, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll have uh, another little surprise, also based on the notion that we're doing with a local artist. And uh, we'll also show our skateboard, aluminum uh, intensive skateboard there as well, with some of the technology elements in the vehicle. And, and it might be a little video of another teaser video on the pair, but it'll be very teaser-like. Uh, it's too early to show too much of that. Yeah. So a lot going, lot going on. In fact, uh, and in fact you, you did create some news, because one of the questions was, can you share some news today? But you've just <laughs> shared some news about our, our model lineup. So we'll, I think we'll stop that for now. Um, a question actually about asset light, our asset light model. How's, the, how's our asset light approach helped us with achieving uh, the sustainable product vision? Well, first of all, you know, our, to build a factory is an incredible amount of pollution. You're creating, pouring concrete and, and maybe having to tear down a forest or whatever, depending on where you build it. But, um, you know, for us, we are going into an existing manufacturing facility that, by the way, is CO2 neutral. Next year, when we start our production, all powered by hydro, some solar, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that's, and that's Magnus facility, of course, in Graz in Austria. So I think that is uh, a, a huge step and in, in the right direction. And it allows us to really have our uh, engineering development team here in our facility here in Manhattan Beach concentrate on you know sustainable materials sustainable suppliers etc instead of having to think about you know manufacturing uh, which is obviously a, a huge heavy lift that you have to do as a startup and you know I think history has shown that it's very difficult to produce a car and it's very difficult to do it right out of, of the, the bat the first time you ever do it in high quality I mean look you have to face it the traditional car makers have spent maybe the last 40, 50 years perfecting manufacturing, and it takes a long time. So we are together with a manufacturing partner which have already done all that. Uh, so that is helping us a lot. It helps us to speed up the process of getting uh, vehicles to market. You know, this is something that we see is happening in other industries, the technology industry, Apple, Foxconn. Now we happen also to have a partnership with Foxconn, but I think this is really sort of our philosophy we may do more integrating later in the company as we move on, but uh, you know, like anything growing up, you evolve. And I think right now it's the right thing for us to do, getting as many products out as possible in as high quality as possible and for the right price so we can really compete. A question for you about um, temperatures. So we're here in California, it's always sunny in 72, but what goes into the thought process when you're looking at, you know, designing cars that are going to be sold in the Middle East or have to endure an Arizona summer right the way through to a Michigan winter? Absolutely. We test actually all of our material. There's a standard test for automotive that all of our materials have to go through just to make sure from the very cold to the very hot and humidity or, or dryness that it withstands all those uh, conditions. Yeah. Um, why, why, Henrik, back to, back to your question on... on what do you think has held back our industry in terms of producing sustainable vehicles? Has it been technology? Has it been 
desire, customer pull? What, what do you think? No, I, I think it's just that it's, it's an incredible, um, you know, capital intensive industry. We're talking about billions of dollars. And once that machine is up and running, very few people want to change it because it's already running. They've already invested billions of dollars, which is why it really took external influences to change this entire industry to move towards electrification. It didn't come from within the traditional car industry. And I think that next change of creating even more sustainable vehicles with new materials that haven't been used before will also come from outside the traditional car industry because we don't have any deals with somebody that we have spent the last 30 years to, you know, making stuff for us uh, that, that we have to sort of adhere to and we have to take to keep the, you know, that alliance going. So therefore we can pick and choose all these new type of materials like I mentioned, we get faster to market. Um, and, and I think this is sort of also very refreshing and a good, uh, uh, you know, competitive environment that we are creating in the industry for the entire industry to move forward. Because in the, indus in the end of the day, it only works for the entire industry to move forward. Now, for us at Fisker, we feel we have a competitive advantage because we think we can not only move faster than everybody else, but we can actually keep reducing this time to market as we move forward and we already have a lead so if we can keep that lead i think we can stay ahead of the pack for a very long time yeah, yeah. well um time flies when you're having fun i guess um that's actually all we've got time for today so nadia thank you very much for uh, for, for, for joining us and sharing your insights and uh, thank you to everyone out there for joining us today on this live stream we're going to do this again uh,